Well, it's my privilege this evening to introduce our speaker, um, who is currently minister at Southeast Protestant Reformed Church. Um, as all of you probably know, he is an alumni of this area, and we are very happy to have Robert Matman this evening to speak for us on Luther and the Cross. Reverend. Thank you, Jeremy, for the introduction, and thank you to the Crete Evangelism Committee for the opportunity to speak to you this evening on Martin Luther and the theology of the cross. A theology of the cross that we heard in the prayer a few moments ago and in the psalms that we sang, and a theology that is given us by the apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which when you read, Perhaps we're familiar with that passage, but if you just step back and listen to the language that the Holy Spirit uses, it's shocking language. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25, because the foolishness of God, foolishness of God, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God, the weakness of God, is stronger than men. And what we read earlier about how God uh, makes the uh, foolishness uh, or the wisdom of men, he makes it foolishness. He chooses the little things and the things that are not to bring the, the, to naught the things that are. And the idea of 1 Corinthians 1, which is the idea of the theology of the cross, is that God's way turns man's way upside down. When it comes to the wisdom of this world, what does the world behold in the self revelation of God in Jesus Christ? The world. Uh, it, it's apparent foolishness. God works in foolishness. Or when it comes to the world's and natural man's conception of strength, what does the world behold? What, is it, what does it seem like to the human eye at the cross? Great weakness like you've never seen before, the weakness of God in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's God's way that defies human notions and expectations in God's way that abases man and brings man very low and even kills man, as it were, as we die together with Jesus Christ and rise to life with his righteousness and with his life. Now this, this pattern, this way of God, you find throughout Scripture. <clears throat> and one of the things that we hope to see this evening is that the theology of the cross, it's, it's a whole great perspective on all of life. It's not limited to one aspect of theology or one uh, compartment of human life, but it's a whole life paradigm here. Think about how God works. Jesus, for example, in the disciples that he chose, he chooses a publican of all people, a, a, a tax collector, one of the most hated men in the land, and Jesus plucks him to be one of his disciples. Or think about Jesus in the temple. Uh, when the, when the Pharisees are there and, and we, we learn of the children that are singing the praises of Jesus and the Pharisees want Jesus to shut the mouths of those children, how dare they blaspheme like that. And Jesus, he sanctions that and he says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. God using the mouth of children to put to naught the enemies of Jesus. Choosing the foolish things as it were, the little things, the weak things to confound the wisdom of the wise. Or think about the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians when he talks about the thorn in his flesh. God, has, God gives him this thorn. The Apostle Paul knocks hard on God's door asking God to take this uh, thorn from him. God says no. And God says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. What? The strength of God made perfect in human weakness. And the Apostle says, when I am weak, then am I strong. It's all upside down according to the, the standards of human reasoning and human expectation about how we think God should work. And that's basically the, the idea 
of the theology of the cross. Well, what, what does that mean, the theology of the cross? Now, the cross, of course, was an event that took place about 2,000 years ago. But important to remember is that God, through the preaching of the gospel, he brings that cross, that one-time event, he brings it right into the present. And he, he conveys it, as it were, to, to mankind of all ages. And the theology of the cross is not simply a doctrine concerning substitutionary atonement, though that's included, but as, a, as was said in the bulletin quote uh, this past week in Crete, it's a way of understanding. It is a hermeneutic, that is, it is a, a certain form of interpretation of life and, and, of, and of the way that God works, a lens through which uh, we behold things. And the theology of the cross, as explained by Martin Luther, is set against and opposed to what's called the theology of glory. And these are sort of technical terms, and both the theology of the cross and the theology of the glory, they have to do with how God relates to man. They have to do with the knowledge of God, the way of salvation, and they're radically opposed. The theology of glory against which Luther takes the act. Now you might say, well, isn't that a good thing, a theology of glory? Is not the Christian religion, doesn't it have to do with glory? We are glorified together with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's good glory. But theology of glory, that technical term, is glory in a bad sense. It is glory as man conceives of it and as man thinks glory should be, defined by man's thoughts and expectations. And the theology of glory, as Luther explains, is a theology in which you have man trying to climb into heaven by his own works. Or man seeking to arrive at the knowledge of God through human reasoning and human notions about who God is. Well, what is the theology of the cross? Well, not every theology that mentions the cross is a theology of the cross. There are some theologies that may speak a lot about cross, but are effectively a theology of glory, but with the name cross in it. Any theology, for example, that would posit that the death of Jesus Christ uh, is you know, a means for, uh, to help man along man's way of climbing into heaven say, a moral example, or a cross and a Jesus that is uh, there to, you know, offer a, a helping hand to man on his way to heaven. The theology of the cross, as Luther interprets it, is a, the a theology in which man is reduced to nothing. Man really dies together with Jesus Christ. And man's pride, our self-righteousness, our inflated view of ourselves and our works are put to death. And we rise together with Christ, with his righteousness, and with his life. The theology of the cross when it comes to the knowledge of God is a theology in which God is rightly known through Christ crucified. In which we behold who God is in weakness and suffering and shame and foolishness because that's how God has revealed himself to man in Jesus Christ. Now the, these terms, the theology of the cross and the theology of glory, uh, come from Luther's Heidelberg Disputation, which we have right here and we'll be quoting from this evening. Luther's Heidelberg Disputation. And that's not something we're very familiar with, I don't think. We're familiar with the 95 Theses, right? That's the day when Luther tacked the, the Theses on the church door regarding indulgences, and things really began to stir when those Theses uh, got disseminated. But if you read the 95 Theses, you know, what you're going to find out is, is they have a lot to do with indulgences and things like that. And if you had expected to see in the 95 Theses you know, all of Luther's theology, the whole program of his theology, you're not going to find it there. But a year later, in 1518, 
Luther presents the theses, which are really talking points, you might say, in Heidelberg. Things had begun to stir. People were getting a little nervous. And so Luther is told to prepare theses to discuss his theology with his, August, his fellow Augustinian monks in Heidelberg. And the theses that Luther presents in 1518 at this disputation were revolutionary, shocking even. And if you had been a, a, a classic monk under the Roman Catholic system listening to this, it, it would have either been the most refreshing thing you've ever heard or you would have wanted to kill him because of what he was doing against Roman Catholic theology. He tears down the, the whole system that had been developed and he returns to the cross, to looking at Jesus for an understanding of who God is. And it's in these theses, these talking points that Luther presents in the form of paradoxes in which Luther uh, addresses the difference between the theology of the cross and the theology of glory. So that by way of introduction, and the the way we're going to order things tonight, in the first place we're going to see the great contrast, the great divide between the theology of the cross and the theology of glory when it comes to the way of salvation, righteousness before God. The second place we're going to look at the difference between the theology of cross and theology of glory when it comes to the knowledge of God. And finally, we're going to see how these realities and the theology of the cross, again, is a paradigm, a, a, a lens, a template, as it were, for the whole Christian life. A, a life that is characterized not by glory as man wants it and expects it, but a life that's characterized by cross by weakness, suffering, hardship, trouble, and all the rest. And the theology of the cross addresses that. All right, well, in the first place, the way of salvation. The way of salvation. The great question for Martin Luther, of course, was how is man just with God? How can I, puny, sinful creature of the dust, be be justified, be accepted uh, of God and Uh, become an heir of eternal life. Well, the theology of glory is is a proud theology in which man tries to get there himself. A theology in which one trusts in his own efforts and in his own ability to do what it takes for righteousness before God. And so in the Roman Catholic system at that time, what was taught is that human works that appear very pious on the outside, think of the works in the monasteries, like the holiest things, the system taught that those works in some way contribute to righteousness or to your standing before God. Luther took that very seriously, more seriously probably than any monk ever had before, and it killed him. Uh, metaphorically speaking. Now we could say, oh, the Roman Catholics and oh, the Pharisees. Uh, but to use the expression of Gressa Machen, beware of this, where we say, like the Pharisee, God, I thank thee that I'm not like that other man is, uh, the Pharisee. Or God, I thank thee that I'm not like those Roman Catholics who trust in their own works and think that uh, they're going to get to heaven because of something they do. You see, one of the points here is that the theology of glory is in us by nature. That leaven is there. We are inveterate theologians of glory who want to climb in by our works and have a piece of the pie when it comes to achieving salvation. Another thing that was taught by the Roman Catholic Church, and this was the theology Luther was taught, uh, had to do with the will. The will. So, Roman Catholicism teaches that grace is necessary for salvation. Now, we probably didn't think that. Maybe we've been, we probably don't really understand the Roman Catholic system uh, as it is. If we think that Roman Catholic Church teaches justification by works, that's not what they teach. They include works into into the equation, yes, but it's couched in terms of faith and grace and 
all of the rest. So the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, taught that grace is necessary for salvation, but that man can prepare himself for grace by doing what is in him. That is, man, by trying, by doing the best he can, by his free will, can prepare himself for grace. And God, uh, even though he, wouldn't, he doesn't have to, quote unquote, God will honor that man trying his best to prepare himself for grace, and God will reward that with, uh, with grace. All right, so what does Luther teach now? Here comes Luther, this monk. There's a buzz in the air about him because people realize that something big is happening. They've heard about the 95 Theses. Here he is in Heidelberg, 1518, and he's, he's presenting these theses before the Augustinians. And, and what are some of the things he says? All right, number one. The law of God, the most salutary doctrine of life, cannot advance man on his way to righteousness, but rather hinders him. Bombshell. The, the monks and the system turning to the law for their righteousness, the way of human works. Luther says, not only can it not advance you on your way to righteousness, it, either, it actually hinders you. Uh, this law becomes your accuser. Number two. Much less can human works, which are done over and over again with the aid of natural precepts, so to speak, lead to that end. But now, especially number three. And again, for, for, for someone who prides himself on his works and, think, and thinks that's his ticket to heaven, here's number three. Although the works of man always seem attractive and good, they are nevertheless likely to be mortal sins. Can you imagine hearing that? Here you are, you've been taught your whole life about doing good works uh, to get to heaven by them. And Luther says those good works that you do for your righteousness are likely to be mortal sin. And the, you know what, that's in the Confessions too, is it not? Belgian Confession 24, when it says we do no work but what is polluted by our flesh and also punishable. Even our best works, if God were to enter into strict account with them, God were to enter into strict judgment with the best of our works, they'd shrivel up and die before his justice. Well, what did he say about the will? Another bombshell. You know, Martin Bucer was in the audience, and the way I heard it is that he must have written a letter to someone uh, having remembered some of these theses, and he, could, he couldn't even he couldn't believe it. That what this man was doing. And it was very refreshing for, for Martin Bucer to, to hear these words. Here's the Heidelberg Theses on the Will, number 13. Free will after the fall exists in name only. And as long as it does what it is able to do, it commits a mortal sin. So rather than man by his free will preparing himself for grace, when man does what is in him by his free will, he, he sins. And then number 16, the person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him adds sin to sin so that he becomes doubly guilty. For a man to suppose that by his free will he can prepare himself for grace, not only does he not prepare himself, he makes himself doubly guilty by trying. So this was, again, revolutionary. It is Martin Luther, on the basis of Scripture and the, the church fathers, especially Augustine, taking the act to the whole theology of glory system. Now what about the theology of the cross? Well, when it comes to, hum when it comes to man, what man is, man's efforts, man's deeds, and all of the rest. As far as man's ability towards salvation is concerned, the cross is actually an indictment against that. It is God pressing charges against mankind, saying you have sinned and you are sinners. 
It is, it's the revelation of the cross over and against man. One of the authors that I read in preparation for this wrote a book, uh, Luther, Luther's Theology of the Cross, uh, named von Lowenick. And this is what he says, The cross of Christ is the great no to all human endeavor. When it comes to that inherent attempt on man's part to work for it, to endeavor for it, to achieve it by doing it, the cross is the great no to all human endeavor. And another theologian who wrote about this named Gerhard Furti uh, wrote a book called On Being a Theologian of the Cross makes the salient point, when it comes to man's free will, what did man do? He slew the Messiah. That's some free will on the part of man that when it does what it wants, slays God in the flesh. And it's just an exposition of sin on the part of man. This idea that the cross is an indictment against us and the idea that the cross actually negates us, reduces us to nothing. I find to be captured in a poem by John Newton. John Newton. And it's entitled, The Cross. And I'll read this poem for you, and I think that you will, you will understand this idea of how the cross is the great no to us, but also that at that cross, through Jesus Christ and Him risen from the dead, we are, we are made alive. He says here in this poem, In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear. Now when it says evil there, you know, maybe we think of licentiousness and, um, and, and all of that. But you realize that it's also, self-righteousness is also evil. You could include that in this poem too. In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never to my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I'll die that thou mayest live. Thus, while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace that seals my pardon too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled, that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. That's the theology of the cross. The cross presses charges against us, slays us. And yet, at that same cross is the word of God's forgiveness to us for the sake of the blood of Christ Jesus and him crucified. And through Jesus crucified and risen from the dead, we live together with him. Now one more thing when it comes to the theology of, uh, on this point of salvation and righteousness and the death of human deeds for salvation um, and the reduction of man to nothingness. Understand that by nature we will not have this theology. And that's another point that Gerhard Fierty in his book makes very, makes very well. Uh, he says, if we think about it this way, that the theology of the cross is this thing that it's up to us, you know, to choose or not to choose, and it's kind of on us whether we want it or not. He says we missed the point there as well. We're still trying to have a piece of the action. We still, at the end of the day, want it to be because of something we did or chose, but that's not how it works. 
we're not in control, even when it comes to this, this theology. It's not us, by our doing, making it effective, making the cross effective. Rather, it, uh, faith is the fruit of the effect of the cross on us. It's not our doing, it's we are done to by the self-revelation of God in Jesus. It is effective, and we are effected by it. Again, by nature, we will not have it because which of us wants to be, as it were, reduced to nothing? You know, the cross, as it were, it robs us of any works on which we might have had our our hopes set or our hopes pinned. It, it, It takes it all away. And we are made sinners, as it were. Like we are made what we really are. It's, we're confronted with that. Our eyes are, are open to that. And that's not a pleasant thing, according to the flesh. Who wants to die? It's a good death. Whereby we are crucified together with Jesus. Hear Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Now, actually, that, that quote's, uh, we won't read that quote, it's a little long, but it's a, it's a dandy. And maybe now you're all thinking, please read the quote, we want to hear Martin Luther. So we, maybe we will read the Martin Luther. But uh, Van Lowenick, okay, Luther's Theology of the Cross, he puts it this way, one may speak of faith in a person when he has renounced everything that he possesses, when he has abandoned everything in the presence of God, A stance of faith means that man perceives the impossibility of his stance before God, even though it may appear ever so irreproachable in the eyes of men and to his own conscience. The first step faith uh, faith takes, a step that must be taken again and again, is the negation of ourselves, the thoroughgoing demolition of all of our own glory. To believe, he goes on to say, means to undertake to die. And Martin Luther uses the word despair in his theses and in the bondage of the will as well. And he says that as long as a man is persuaded that he himself can do even the least thing towards his salvation, he retains some self-confidence and does not altogether despair of himself. And therefore he is not humbled before God but presumes that there is, or at least hopes or desires that there may be some place, time, and work for him by which he may at length attain to salvation. But again, what the cross it does to us, it, it, it empties us of that vain notion. And it empties us and it lays us low and God fills us and enriches us and exalts us through Jesus Christ and his righteousness. See, the, the theology of the cross is not just about negating man for the, for the sake of it, but it is God's way of reducing us to nothing in the service of exalting us together with Jesus. He empties us in order to fill us. He abases us in order to exalt us. And Martin Luther in the Heidelberg Disputation definitely talks about that exaltation, uh, that enrichment, that uh, being filled He says 25 of the Heidelberg Disputation. He says, and again, what a bombshell. He is not righteous who does much, but who, without work, believes much in Christ. Justification by faith alone. Righteousness not by doing, but righteousness by faith. Which is to say, a not working for, but a receiving as free gift what God freely gives. In uh, Thesis 26, he says, the law says, quote, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. That right there, that is liberty, that's freedom, that's the gospel that sets free. It is a good death whereby we die to ourselves according to that self-righteous theologian glory way. And it is a wonderful resurrection whereby we are set free from having to work for it or having to do for it, but receive it all as free gift and are set uh, into liberty as Christians 
to seek to do God's will in gratitude for him. It's interesting, in Luther's explanation of Thesis 25, it's very interesting. It's almost as though he already could hear the charge of antinomian coming from what he was saying. Because in his explanation, he says, I wish to have the words, quote, without work understood in the following manner. Not that the righteous person does nothing, but that his works do not make him righteous. Rather, that his righteousness creates works. In other words, works contribute nothing to justification, and so forth. So again, the matter, the problem is not the law. Uh, the problem is when works done according to the law are done in order to obtain justification before God and contribute to one's salvation. Well, that's a brief overview of the theology of the cross when it comes to the way of salvation and when it comes to righteousness before God. And I hope you have seen that uh, the theology of the cross takes the acts, the theology of glory, and magnifies the righteousness of God that God worked out in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Another thing now that we want to consider in the second place is uh, the, the knowledge of God. How do we know God? What is God like? How does God work? Who is he? In the theology of glory and the theology of the cross give two very different answers to that. Two very different answers. And, and we'll read some more theses out of the Heidelberg Disputation. But, to summarize it, Theology of glory is about man arriving at who God is based on man's notions of what God should be and how God should work. The idea is man taking what he knows about things like righteousness and power and strength and extrapolating those who God is. So forming a knowledge of God based on human notions about what these things are and how these things should look. What Martin Luther does, well, not just Martin Luther, but again, Luther is emphatically on the base of Holy Scripture here. What does the Bible say about that? When man tries to form a notion of God by his own um, natural knowledge, natural theology, you might say. Well, Romans 1 verse 22 says that they, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So much for knowledge according to the theology of glory. 1 Corinthians 1 says, quote, The world by wisdom knew not God. Think about this. When man operates according to his own notions and his own natural knowledge, he, not only does he miss God, but he rejects God at exactly the place where God has chiefly revealed himself which is the cross of Jesus Christ. Robert Kolb. Robert Kolb, Lutheran theologian, uh, says this, of all the places to search for God, the last place most people would think to look is the gallows. That's where, that's, that's where you find God, at the gallows. And God in the flesh is the one who's on the gallows. Of all the places to search for God, the last place most people would think to look is the gallows. Martin Luther confessed that there in the shadows cast by death, God does indeed meet his straying, rebellious human creatures. There God reveals who he is. There he reveals who they are. Not in flight beyond the clouds, but in the dust of the grave, God has come to tell it like it is about himself and about humanity. All right, what does Luther say about this? Uh, Heidelberg Disputation, Theses 19 through 24. That person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. People who are looking for God, uh, apart from the way God has revealed himself, don't deserve to be called a theologian. Number 20. He deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends 
the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. 21, a theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Think about the cross. Romans 1 verse 21. That's a good thing, right? We call it Good Friday. Uh, the preaching of the gospel, that is a good thing. That is a good gospel. But the theologian of, the, of, of glory, he calls, it, he calls it evil. It's foolishness. It's stumbling block. It's rejected. It's mocked. It's spit upon. He calls a good thing evil, but he calls an evil thing good. The theologian of glory calls his own works good when, as Luther says, they're actually sin because he's trying to be saved by them. So when it comes to the knowledge of God, the language that you find in Luther is the idea of a God who hides himself. A God who is veiled in suffering and in weakness. A God who hides himself, that's the word Luther uses, he hides himself under opposites, under contrary appearances. Basically, the exact opposite way than man would expect to find and to see God. God is righteous. God is strong. God is holy. And all of the rest. What does it look like? A man from Nazareth dying and bleeding on a Roman cross, suffering one of the worst executions the world had to offer, his blood dripping to the ground. There is the righteous and holy sinless, majestic, almighty God. Crucified, the almighty God in the flesh. Crucified in weakness. The glorious one hanging in shame and suffering. The righteous one dying between evildoers. You see how that just turns everything upside down. And to the natural eye, he misses God. He walks right past it. And not only that, but he spits on it on the way by. God hides himself to the pride of man. He won't be seen man's way. He will not be seen and known in a way that countenances human pride. But he makes himself known in a way that confronts man, drops man to the ground because of man's sin against him. God hiding in plain sight. In this, in this connection, Luther uh, quotes Hebrews 11, verse 1. We all know that verse, but let's take it seriously. Faith is the substance of things, uh, the evidence of things hoped for, the, the, or the substance of things not seen, okay? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. Faith, as it were, sees the unseen. It perceives God who is hidden in the suffering and in the shame and in the weakness. It is, it is the gift of God whereby he is recognized as he has revealed himself on the cross. Or think Isaiah chapter 53. You see this so vividly in Isaiah 53. This idea of a God who hides himself under opposites. In this case, God in Jesus Christ the Messiah. In Isaiah 52, verse 9, he says, uh, Isaiah, by the inspiration of the Spirit, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. So the image there is God rolling his sleeves up for the salvation of his people. So what does that look like? When God rolls his sleeves up to redeem Israel, well, how does that appear? Exactly the opposite than you would expect. Exactly the opposite of the expectation of the, of the Jews in the days of Jesus. 
How, how does he appear? Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Isaiah is saying there, us, by nature, we don't, we don't choose the cross. We don't bow down at the foot of the cross. We, we turn as far away as we can from that mess and from that suffering. But God opens our eyes. And what do we see at the cross? God going forth for our salvation through Jesus Christ and Him crucified as a sin offering for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. Here's Israel with their eyes open. Here's the believing church. He, it was for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And that knowledge, it abases us because it exposes our sin. And by the knowledge of Jesus Christ, God exalts us because this here is our Savior, Redeemer, Messiah. Thou art a God who hides thyself. Luther quotes Isaiah 45. In his explanation to Thesis 20, Thesis 20, where he says, He deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. In his explanation of that thesis, his proof for it, he quotes 1 Corinthians 1.21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, so, so much for the world's wisdom, all of its wisdom, it could never know God through it. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. It turns everything upside down. And Luther says, now it is not sufficient for anyone, and it does him no good to recognize God in his glory and majesty, unless he recognizes him in the humility and shame of the cross. Thus God destroys the wisdom of the wise, as Isaiah 45, 15 says, Truly thou art a God who hidest thyself. He also quotes John 14, verse 8. So here's a little uh, synopsis of these two theologies. In John 14, verse 8, where Philip spoke according to the, the theology of glory, show us the Father. Philip, who, who you know, full of this desire for glory, Show, show us the Father, like Moses, show me, show me thy glory. Christ forthwith, says Luther, set aside his flighty thought about seeking God elsewhere and led him to himself, saying, Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. For this reason, true theology and recognition of God are in the crucified Christ. There is God rightly known. So what a what a inscrutable way of God there, that he reveals himself in precisely in such a way that he is hidden, the natural reason, wisdom, knowledge of man, and that he reveals himself in, in, in such a, a, precisely in this way to us, the way of the cross. Well, these principles here that we have been considering They are big picture principles that you find worked out throughout the Christian life. Both this idea of uh, abasement and exaltation and this idea of a God who hides himself in suffering and weakness and a God who likes to work in lowliness and foolishness and things like that. Apparent lowliness and foolishness. You see, you see this theology of the cross in, in, the Reformed, in the Reformed creeds. Lord's Day 33, for example, what is true conversion? Here's the picture of the Christian life. And what's the first thing? Dying. Mortification of the old man. A lifelong dying. To a, a dying of ourselves, according to the old. Reduced. Sorrow for sin. And rising together. Uh, with Jesus Christ, a, a, the quickening of the new man. And that does feel like a dying, does it not? 
when God really exposes to us just how bad it is with us, how sinful we are, how proud we are, the evil that is in us. I mean, that is, that, we, we are reduced, see? But the gospel lifts us up and it says, here's Christ and his righteousness, free gift. You live because of Jesus. Or think Lord's Day 44, right? Why will God have the law so strictly preached and so man in this life can keep them? That's a theology of the cross in a way. The first thing, so that we may learn more and more to know our own sinfulness. Really? That's dying. That we may become the more earnest in seeking remission of sins and everlasting righteousness in Jesus Christ. Think about the theology of the cross when it comes to sanctification. And this way of God whereby he makes us weak and does his strength in our weakness. The Apostle Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. If we thought sanctification was by our self-effort, self-improvement, me getting along with Jesus at my side to to give me a helping hand, we had any notion that the, the sanctified life of the Christian is just kind of this gradual, smooth, uphill uh, walk. I mean, God just, he makes it all come crashing down. And God exposes, I mean, all of our resolutions, they come crashing to the ground. Here we are trying to sanctify ourselves by our own work and by our own effort and our supposed strength. And we're brought to nothing. And we're, we're made weak. And God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weak. When I am weak, then am I strong. Depending on Jesus Christ by faith. Think about the theology of the cross when it comes to the Christian church. Corporate life in the body takes the shape of a cross. Uh, the Lutheran theologians you like to use the word cruciform. The Christian life is cruciform, having the shape of the cross. And that applies now uh, to the matter of the church as well. You see, what we want by nature is we want a, a glorious, glamorous church, right? Big numbers, um, maybe even flashing lights. Important people. By nature, man wants a church that offers health, prosperity, Ease from the troubles of this life. Wouldn't that be nice if in church you were finally freed from the sorrows and cares and troubles of this life? But but how does God work? He works in lowliness. He works in weakness. He is present in humility. And what God likes to make uh, for himself a church that is, according to the human eye, unspectacular, unglorious, not only ordinary, but lowly and humble. That's the arena in which God is pleased to work. Ordinary means like preaching of the gospel. If someone who never knew about church before were to walk into uh, church, um, you would hope that he would say, well, this, this, is, this is kind of, maybe he'd even say dumb. People getting together, hearing a man talk from the floor. What's, what's this about? No, there's nothing fancy. There's nothing glorious about it. It's not a sports arena. It's ordinary means, preaching the gospel, water applied uh, to people's heads, sharing bread and wine at the table of the Lord, right? Well, that's, that's lowliness. There's weakness and humility that God is present. He's present right in the midst of that ordinary. And as for the people that compose the church, well, they're sinners. They are lowly, humble people with all kinds of problems. We ought to remember that too when we we come to church. Uh, You know, as someone once said, the church is not a museum of saints, it's a hospital for sinners. It's a place where medicine is administered to sick. God is pleased to work in lowliness and humility. Think about the Christian life when it comes to our callings as Christians. Well, it's not a rose garden. It's not an easy, breezy life. And if someone, uh, you know, thought that the Christian life would be one that's free of trouble, 
well, God turns it all upside down. And what did we expect? You could apply this to so many callings, but let's just apply the theology of the cross to this one area briefly of Christian parents raising children. Christian parents raising children. There's one author that I uh, read a little bit in connection with this lecture, and the subtitle of the book was The Nine Essential Failures of a Faithful Life. The Nine Essential Failures of a Faithful Life. And he's just applying the theology of the cross here, this idea. And chapter 4 is entitled, Super Moms, Uber Dads, and Other People Who Don't Exist. The Failure to Be a Perfect Parent. His point is, that's like you, experiencing that failure is good. Like that's a good death. And it's a liberating death as well. By nature, theologians of glory, parents, uh, Christian parents, by nature, theologians of glory, want to raise, you know, uh, perfect children, perfect home, kind of home that gets the oohs and ahs from other people looking in. Wow, what a fine home they have, right? And then what does God do? Well, he reduces us to nothing. And he exposes to us not only the sins of our children, fair enough, but no less exposes to us our own sins as parents and our selfishness and our pride and how we have so many problems and how we're so messed up and evil by nature, even when it comes to raising, when it, when it comes to raising children. And that, that's a dying to ourselves according to who we are as theologians of glory. He disillusions us of our grand aspirations. He disappoints our, our resolutions and all the rest. But it's liberating. Because it's like through the gospel, God, he tells us, you don't have to be perfect uh, to be right with me or to impress others. It's just, it's ordinary Christian parents bringing up children along gospel principles. Not a home where no one's a sinner, but a home in which sinners together confess faults one to another and forgive one another. Things like that. Like that's liberating. Not, had, not being in that bondage of the theology of glory and being set free by the gospel to live the Christian life under our head. Again, you could apply that to so many different areas of life. When it comes to the theology of the cross and the Christian life, uh, one more, uh, well, one more quote from Luther uh, and then a poem by Luther with which we will end. But, the theology of the cross and the Christian life means that God often does not work the way that we expect. And intentionally, God does not work the way that we expect or the way that we would want him to work. And Luther experienced this for himself in his uh, life as, as a minister and a very big position, of course, in Wittenberg. And this is a commentary on Joseph. Now, Joseph was a man from a human perspective. It's like everything was upside down. Godly Joseph. And yet the evil that's done to him. Sold, what did he do wrong? And then sold by his brothers into Egypt. And then he's thrown in jail after Potiphar's wife uh, slanders him. I mean, from a human perspective, you'd say that this man was uh, far from God to be suffering the way that he was suffering. And yet, God was so present with Joseph and blessing Joseph. Well, Martin Luther says in his commentary there, Therefore, let us learn this rule and order which God is wont to employ in governing his saints. For I too have often attempted to prescribe to God definite methods he should use in the administration, either of the church or of other matters. Ah, Lord, I have said, I would like this to be done in this order with this result. But God would do the very opposite of what I had thought. Then the thought would come to me, nevertheless, my plan is not disadvantageous to the glory of God, but it will contribute very much toward the hollowing of thy name the gathering and increasing of thy kingdom and the propagation of the knowledge of thy word. In short, it is a very fine plan and excellently thought out. But the Lord undoubtedly laughed at this wisdom and said, Come now, I know that you are a wise and learned man, but it has never been my custom for Peter, Dr. Martin, or anyone else to teach, direct, govern, and lead me. I am not a passive God. I am an active God who is accustomed to do the leading, ruling, and directing. Theology of the cross. Turning the wisdom 
of man upside down and working God, uh, God working in his way, a cross way, which is for our good. Finally, when it comes to the theology of the cross and the trials and sufferings uh, in the Christian life, and now in particular the trials and sufferings of this present age, the trials and sufferings of this present age. And the theology of the cross takes it very seriously. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't minimize it. It doesn't downplay it. It takes it very seriously, the trials and sufferings of this present age. The suffering and trial, for example, when the child of God is in the midst of heavy trial and suffering, Perhaps in the wake of the death of a loved one. Perhaps in a time of great depression. Perhaps in a time that's so deep that to use the words of C.S. Lewis, uh, the child of God, she looks round upon a universe from which every trace of God seems to have vanished and asks why he has, why she has been forsaken. You know, Luther experienced those moments. There were times when he felt God forsaken, destined to hell because of his sin. There were those times in the life of the child of God when those questions in the Psalms that maybe we blush at if we really looked hard at them, when those questions in the Psalms start to really burn and ring in his soul, questions like, Awake, O God, why sleepest thou? Or, uh, Will God be favorable no more? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or, Maybe you feel like the disciples in, in the boat as they're going across Galilee and they wake Jesus up saying, Master, do you care that we perish? Do you care? Well, see, those are moments in which this idea of opposites and contrary appearances, like we experience those. In other words, times when we experience and our circumstances appear to be the exact opposite than the way that we should have expected things to go for them that belong to Christ Jesus, the children of God. You know, all of this that we know of God, and yet sometimes we just cannot make sense of it, and it's incongruous, and it's frustrating. Well, the theology of the cross does not pretend to be able to make sense of everything. The theology of the cross does not pretend to have everything figured out and to know all of the reasons back of X, Y, or Z suffering or trial. But what does it teach? Remember that idea of a God who hides himself? God who is present when he feels absent. When he's so very close, even when he feels so very far away. According to human feeling, how we feel, according to human senses, what we see and what we hear with our eyes, let's say, or human experience, well, those human capacities of us, what they register in that moment is God absent from us. It feels like God is sleeping in heaven, disinterested and unknowing in what we're going through. That's the human Uh, That's what human feeling registers to us. But God, thou art a God who hides thyself. He's present in the weakness. He is operative in the suffering. He is near when he feels far, present in absence. How unscrutable are his ways. And that experience culminated in the experience of God himself on the cross in Jesus Christ. That's another thing that the theology of the cross will do. It directs the person to the cross of Jesus Christ and it says, listen, this God that you have is a God who knows all about suffering. In fact, he suffered more than any any other uh, person on the face of this earth who was done evil against, who was reproached, and so much more, God incarnate the Lord Jesus Christ And God incarnate who himself cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt forsaken of God. He felt as though God were so far from him, absent, disinterested, 
uncaring more than that, God pouring out his wrath upon the head of Jesus Christ. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, we, we recognize God, even though we can't see him with our eyes. By faith, we, we believe God's word, even though what we feel and what we experience seems to be testifying to the opposite of what God's word says. Think Abraham, when God tells Abraham to offer up Isaac, yes, Abraham, your only begotten son and the one through whom I'm going to bring forth Jesus Christ, the child of promise, that one, put him to death. What a trial for Abraham. What God tells him seems to contradict with the very promise of God. He believes God's word. And by faith, Abraham offered up Isaac, believing God will raise him from the dead. But faith is this gift of God whereby you cling to the word, which is fundamentally Jesus Christ himself, even in spite of how you feel, how you sense, what human sight registers to your view. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It sees the unseen. And it believes God with us, even when he feels absent from us. And we conclude this lecture this evening by reading a poem attributed to Martin Luther, certainly in the spirit of Luther. Feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. Though all my heart should feel condemned for want of some sweet token, there is one greater than my heart whose word cannot be broken. I'll trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. For though all things shall pass away, his word shall stand forever. Thank you for your time this evening. My understanding that at this point we'll sing together, correct, out of the Psalter, Psalter number 128. Psalter number 128, and uh, we'll sing all three stanzas of 128.
Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, give thee thanks for Jesus Christ, thy Son, who was crucified for our transgressions and was raised again for our justification, who through his death and resurrection has brought life and immortality to light by the gospel. Preaching of which is them that perish foolishness, but unto them which are saved, Christ, the power of thee, our God, and the wisdom of thee, our God. Confess our sins before thee. Give thee thanks for the atoning work of our head, whom thou didst make to be sin for us who knew no sin. We might be made the righteousness of thee, our God, in him. Pray, Father, that thou wilt teach us Jesus Christ, cause us to know him more and more, Lead our lives under that cross of which he spake, confidence of heart towards thee, and the earnest expectation of the glory that shall come. Thou hast promised, Father, and thou art even now bringing us to glory, even through the sufferings of this present age. Bless thy church by this gospel. Encourage the hearts of them that are downcast and lonely, feel abandoned, suffer. Assure them, thou art with them. Thou wilt never leave them nor, nor forsake them. Give thee thanks for Jesus Christ, who gave himself even to the forsakenness of the cross, that we might never be accepted of thee. Bless us now as we go our homeward ways. Establish us by thy word and spirit to do thy will. And hear our prayer, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.